Well, our, our next speaker is a native of Seattle, Washington, a West Coaster. Served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve. He joined the John Birch Society in 1964. He was a successful chapter leader, section leader, organizer. Became a coordinator for us in 1970. He served as the coordinator for Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, and the state of Montana. Must have been interesting in the winter. <laughs> in 1981, he left his post as a coordinator and resumed a business career. And after a decade, a little more than a decade, back on our staff, again as a coordinator, and then worked his way up to National Director of Field Activities, National Director of Development, and in 2005 was named the Chief Executive Officer of the John Birch Society. This man brings energy, Amen. talent, and decisiveness to the post of Chief Executive Officer. We're very fortunate. He's married, has two daughters, several grandchildren, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arthur Thompson. Go get him, Arthur. Okay. Thank you very much, Jack. Members of the council, wives, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here again and, and see so many friendly faces. I'd like to thank some people before we get started because these are the backbone of the John Birch Society. I'd like every chapter leader and section leader of the John Birch Society to stand, please, because you're the ones that really put rubber on those tires and make this organization run. So if you could, please stand up. Let's give them a, a round of appreciation. Yeah. You know, we're learning new ways in the John Birch Society. Uh, some of us are kind of like dinosaurs but we don't want to go the route of the dinosaurs. And so we're learning a lot about computers. We have some uh, men in the uh, audience who've come here from headquarters to help us this weekend, and they've taught me a lot about Goggle and Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> the emphasis on Yahoo. <laughs> There's somebody else I kind of would like to uh, introduce to you, an old friend of many, many years ago who was on the staff when I was originally on the staff. And uh, we talk about the youth program, but this man, it was his baby. He was the man that put it together. And I'd like just to introduce Mr. Glenn Dobbs, who used to be on our staff many years ago. Those are fun days. We used to go get them in those days. We used to sit and scheme. How are we going to really tear into these people and make life miserable for the other side? And we used to do a very good job of it. We want that kind of innovation back in the field. We want you to be thinking on your own about how to implement a national agenda as it fits your locale. You know, Edward Hunter is an American who became an expert on brainwashing. Uh, he worked with the United States government in looking into what the North Koreans did to our POWs in Korea. And he coined the term brainwashing, wrote a book about it, which we carried for a number of years. In late 1960, there was a very important conference that was held in Moscow. It was called the, um, the Congress of 81 Communist Parties. And at that conference, Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, stated that they, that they were on their road to victory, and the only thing preventing them from total victory was the rise of the anti-communist movement in the United States. And something had to be done about it, they had to destroy the effectiveness of the, of the anti-communist movement. So orders went out to do that, 
and start a smear against the anti-communist movement with the John Burt Society as its primary focus. Because they saw the potential of the society already, the insiders and the communists had already noticed what the John Burt Society had been doing, even though they were not yet two years old. The John Burt Society had shut down the reciprocal uh, uh, visit of President Eisenhower to the Soviet Union after Khrushchev had visited the United States. Had this President of the United States visited the Soviet Union, it would have given the communists tremendous propaganda and, and a psychological boost in the rest of the world. We were able to stop that from happening, and it shocked them. And so they started to look at the John Birch Society and realize we've got a serious problem here because for the first time in the anti-communist movement, we have a real organization who, which is opposing us. Not a mailing list, not a publication, not a few people getting, to, getting together, but an organization that's organized right down into the neighborhoods to follow a national agenda implemented locally in that neighborhood with energetic leadership, and it terrified them. Our work over the years proved over and over again the worth of organization. I'll give you a couple of examples. Just our support your local police program, our support your local police committees, proves the statement that we were a real danger to the other side. I'd like to give you a couple of examples of the support your local police committees that did wonderful work. Keep in mind, in these days, if for those of you who recall back then, we had bombings, we had riots, we had the inner cities of major areas across the country burning all the time. You know, we had the bomb du jour in those days. <laughs> it wasn't a bomb now and then, it was every day somewhere in the nation. So we had a lot of chaos and problems in the streets. The support your local police committees and other th aspects of the John Birch Society brought sanity back into those cities. One in particular that, that really was su successful was in New York City. The Civilian Police Review Board was a program started by the communists to bring control of local police under radical elements. There are over 10 layers of um, oversight, if you will, on police behavior, starting with internal uh, uh, affairs departments within the local police department, all the way up through the FBI and Attorney General's office in the federal government. They wanted to circumvent that, all of that legal system and bring it under radical control in the local community through these civilian police review boards to where they would control the local police department. And so in New York City, they were able to actually garner the, um, the, um, the public opinion there and organize it and stop the police review board from being implemented there. In fact, they even stopped the presidential aspirations of its mayor, John Lindsay, to where he had to drop out of the race for the United States presidency. Uh, he was a Rockefeller Republican. And in a city of about 8 million, I guess, three dozen activist members of the John Birch Society accomplished that. One of those members is at the head table tonight, Jim Fitzgerald. Hey, Jim. Where's Jim? There he is. He was a cop and he wasn't going to stand for anything. Another example is Dallas, Texas. They tried the same thing there. We were able to enlist people of the caliber of a Lamar Hunt as a sponsor of the Support Your Local Police program. They stopped the police review board there, and you can arguably say that it was the, res the, the result of the activity of the Support Your Local Police program in Dallas that caused the chief of police to resign because he was for it. Not all chiefs of police are apolitical. That was accomplished with approximately uh, a dozen of our, of our members in that process. One of those individuals is at the head table this evening, Mr. Larry Waters. Where are you, Larry?
It doesn't take very many people. It just takes dedication, having the right tools, the right knowledge, being in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. My own personal experience, I'd like to give you a third example in Seattle. There, we not only stopped the Civilian Police Review Board, we actually stopped a riot from taking place by going out and doorbelling the Central District of Seattle and saying, look, there's a planned riot this weekend. Would you please stay home and keep your kids at home? While the rest of the country was burning, Seattle was quiet. And we did it with a dozen people going door to door. Now, as a sidebar to this, it's very interesting. Yeah. Hi, I'm Art Thompson with the John Burke Society. How are you? Oh, glad to meet you. How are you? And we couldn't believe it. We thought we were going into an area that hated Whitey. <laughs> and they were very suspicious until they found out we were from the John Birch Society. And they knew who their friend was. Because we were the ones that were standing up and being on television at night, radio during the day and everything else, saying, hey, look, it's not our house that's going to burn down. It's their house that's going to burn down. And we're trying to stop it. They appreciated it. They really did. And when it comes to the safety of family and home, there is no difference that separates Americans. They probably thought we were from the government. We were, you know, dressed in our dark suit. Well, everybody wore hats, fedoras in those days, and that kind of thing. Hi, I'm from the government here to help you. <laughs> These and many, many other examples could be used to show the value of the John Birch Society and the successes that we have had over the years. Uh, in addition to the specific agenda we offered, just as today, informed Birchers across the country give leadership to other organizations as well. They carry our educational effort into these other organizations, become leaders of these other organizations. This permeates out through the whole country. In fact, the society was so effective in those years that many of us that saw the big picture realized that we were dis uh, disrupting the timetable of the conspiracy for consolidation of world control. In fact, our founder, Robert Welch, said so on more than one occasion. He said, for instance, in the John Birch Society Bulletin of October 1976, quote, this will suggest that our total education program may have done more to slow down the communist advance than all of the other anti-communist organizations put together. That it may in fact have had considerable responsibility for causing the postponement of the consummation in 1976, which the insiders so devoutly wished." Unquote. And it was true. Everything pointed to that year. Then it was pushed back to 87, 89, 2000. We've been able to make them miss their timetable for so many things. Look at the FTAA, that was 2001. Did we or did we not stop that? Yeah. Yeah. Anatoly Galitsyn is arguably the most important defector from the KGB and the Soviet Union in our time. He wrote a book called New Lives for Old in 1984. Now keep in mind, this is before it happened. He said in the book that they are going to cause the demise of communism and the Soviet Union, shut down communism. What they're going to do is take the, the, the visible communist leaders, they're going to keep the communist apparatus in there, but they're going to take all those dirty, nasty, big guys up at the top of the Communist Party and put them off to the side and put some more friendly people in instead, like Gorbachev and others all around in these communist countries. And every person he named in the book that they were going to put in in 1984 was done in 1989, 1990, and 1991. Every one of them.
He said the Berlin Wall is going to come down. It came down. And basically he said they were rescheduling the consolidation of the New World Order at that time. Now this was many, many years before. He's going all the way back to that same 81 Communist Party Congress that they had decided that they were going to probably have to do that and as time went on that's exactly what they did and they pr uh, planned this whole thing of the demise of communism and everything to fool the American people into thinking communism was dead. Now what they did was when they, the American businessman woke up one day and, and his enemy wasn't there anymore. So they closed down the factory producing communism and opened up a new factory to give them a new brand of communism that would get the support of the American businessman who was anti-communist. You know what that new brand was? Free trade. We are building communism now through free trade has nothing to do with free trade. At any rate, they did not like the John Birch Society, not just because of our organization, which they saw was a real organization. They did not like the John Birch Society because we said, wait a minute, our founder showed us there's something more than communism. There's something above communism. There's actually a strategy that pressure from a below and pressure from above. And these two pressures work together towards a common goal of squeezing out middle America. And Robert Welch named the names from those up on high who were part of this. And they couldn't stand it. The other thing they couldn't stand in, in, in relationship to that was they did not want the American people to know there was a conspiracy. Even today, how many people do you know that will not even whisper the word? Because, well, they won't get on Michael Medved <laughs> if I talk about conspiracy or Hannity or those guys. I might not get my column printed from coast to coast. I might not get that national syndication of talk shows if I talk about conspiracy. So we just won't talk about it. That is the kind of, of atmosphere that these people were able to put in, into the American public through the controlled media of let's not even talk about conspiracy. That's a taboo. And that is one of the reasons as well that they hated the John Birch Society because we exposed it and continue to expose it. Remember, in the art of war, if you don't know who your enemy is, I guarantee you, you will lose. We identified the enemy, and the enemy was squealing. And so that was another reason why they didn't like the John Birch Society. The other thing is that, and, and this is really the key thing, I keep saying organization. A lot of people, they think organization they don't quite get what the word means in their mind and sometimes birchers are so used to being involved in an organization they just assume everybody else does the same thing that we do but they don't. We spend a lot of time and money in organizing chapters right down into the neighborhoods. No other organization in this country does that except the Communist Party ladies and gentlemen. We spent a lot of time and money organizing a staff to help those chapters right down there in the neighborhood. Nobody else in this country does that, ladies and gentlemen, except the Communist Party. We are the only ones on our side that does that. We're the only ones that actually get out there and meet their neighbors, their opinion molders right there in the local area and work to educate and organize people. It's expensive. It entails a great deal of work that nobody wants to do. We've been doing it for years. One example that our society is more successful than other organizations was the impeachment of President Clinton. A lot of people wanted to impeach President Clinton. It wasn't until the John Birch Society gave it organization that it started to receive traction. The Washington Post said this in December 15, 1998, quote, 
These early impeachment activists ranged from Robert Bartley of the Wall Street Journal to Representative Robert Barr to the leaders of the John Birch Society. Together, their success is a demonstration of how a determined and ideologically committed group can change the course of history, unquote. The Denver Post put it this way the following month, January 14, 1999, quote, dismissed at the time in the back pages of newspapers as absurd allegations by right-wing conspiracy theorists, the impeachment effort orchestrated by the John Birch Society chipped away largely unseen by the mainstream. Moderate and liberal activists credit John Birch and allied organizations for much of the momentum that carried impeachment, despite majority opposition." Unquote. Thus, the society has had many successes. A lot of times, others have received credit for those successes, and there's basically three reasons for that. One, the work of our members is often invisible. Even when it is visible, the media does not like to give us credit, even if they see us doing the work. And third, other organizations do a better job of marketing themselves, and the controlled media is more than happy to give them the credit. Because they don't want to mention the Birch Society, they don't want people to even know we still exist, they don't want people to rally around us. This is one of the reasons why in the past year we put together a marketing department. And we're doing some, going to be doing some wonderful things with it. It's taken a long time because we're looking at the whole picture of how to market the movement in today's world. Uh, a lot of it's going to be on the internet and things like that. We've already ratcheted up uh, the use of our website by almost three times since October, uh, a year ago, last October. So we're, we're seeing some wonderful things happening. Now we come to a point when we have a tremendous task before us. Now we keep, need to keep these three items I just mentioned in the back of our mind as we go forward. Let me explain. Let me ask a question first. How important is NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, in the general scheme of things? Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State for President Richard Nixon, put it this way, quote, it will represent the most creative step towards a new world order taken by any group of countries since the end of the Cold War. The revolution, the revolution sweeping the Western Hemisphere points to an international order based on cooperation. It is this revolution that is at stake in the ratification of NAFTA. What Congress will have before it is not a conventional trade agreement, but the architecture of a new international system. The Los Angeles Times, July 18, 1993. With these statements, we see a couple of things that Kissinger says. Number one, that NAFTA is a major step towards bringing these United States into a world government, and he seems to have known 10 years before anybody else that the Americas was going Marxist. And that's literally what's happening south of the border. Country after country after country after country is going Marxist, to put it, a nice connotation on it. So he seemed to understand that revolution was already occurring and wanted to have us part of it. To pave the road to the New World Orders, tribunals have been set up by NAFTA which have placed a layer of jurisprudence over and above our country's courts system. In an article in the New York Times in April 18, 2004, a variety of legal minds were aghast at the implications. John D. Echevera, law professor at Georgetown University, said this, quote, of the NAFTA tribunals, this is the biggest threat to the United States judicial, judicial independence that no one has ever heard of and even fewer people understand." Unquote. Peter Shir uh, Spiro, excuse me, law professor, Hofstra University, quote, you have an international tribunal essentially reviewing American court judgments, unquote. Finally, in your own state, 
Chief Justice Ronald George of the California Supreme Court said this, quote, It is rather shocking that the highest courts of the state and federal governments could have their judgments circumvented by these tribunals. So we see the architecture of a new international system, higher than our state and federal courts. This is NAFTA, and it is only the beginning of the problem of NAFTA. A case in point is what's happening in North Carolina right now. There is a coalition of unions from the United States, Mexico, and Canada that has gone to a NAFTA tribunal to uh, challenge the right to work laws in North Carolina. You know, if they have to appeal that, you know who they appeal to? The International Court. Not the Supreme Court, not the State Court, and they can be forced to have those laws overturned through these tribunals. That is the problem we're dealing right now with, with NAFTA. What we are witnessing in so many threats to our country are the effects of NAFTA. The Security and Prosperity Partnership, or North American Union, the NAFTA Free Trade Corridors are just two that come out of NAFTA. In addition, our free trade agreements, such as CAFTA and the, the uh, former FTAA, are all founded on the grandfather of them all, NAFTA. Once both houses of Congress approved NAFTA, they gave, them a blank, uh, they gave NAFTA a blank check and a blank piece of paper to do whatever they wanted to do in the name of free trade. That's literally what's happening. You go and look at everything that's going forward at an international scale in the United States today, you will see NAFTA, 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 the press releases, all the reports, everything else, it's all founded on NAFTA. This is a clue. What we have to do in order to stop these things is to withdraw from NAFTA. Simply put, we cannot stop immigration, the North American Union, preserve the Constitution, work through Congress, or any other aspect of our struggle until we get rid of NAFTA. Because it's becoming the law of the land. It's already the law of the land. It's carte blanche law. And a lot of people don't realize that until you get in and look at all the documents that are carrying this internationalism forward in this country. Worse, I think that these tribunals could even be used to shut down private initiatives such as the Minutemen if they really wanted to. I mean, they've got that kind of power now. They're just not ready to use that power yet. They're doing it incrementally, slowly. It's just like uh, Gulliver and the Lilliputians. NAFTA is slowly lay laying those little cords on the giant of the American public and the American public is generally asleep. They're tossing in their sleep a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed that. They're beginning to wake up a little bit. They don't really know what's bothering them. Something's bothering them, and they don't feel those cords yet, but they kind of sense that there's something laying there that they don't like. And what we have to do is find the best means to inform them what's wrong, organize them, and then move ahead. Isaiah said it so well, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. We have to bring that knowledge to them. The people have allowed their eyes to be diverted thinking that NAFTA was an economic thing and it's not, it's a freedom thing. And that's what we have to show them. A slave is a slave is a slave and a slave by any other name is still a slave. Pardon me, Gertrude Stein, but the thing is that a lot of people don't recognize that yet, and we're going to have to show that to them. This, this, that what we see in NAFTA is the strings of slavery. The bottom line is this. If we do not get rid of NAFTA, everything else we do will be for naught. We cannot stop the North American Union unless we get rid of NAFTA. 
because if we could stop the North American Union, they could put a different name on it. They might not put a name on it at all, but keep the initiative going forward, slowly tightening the regulations, slowly merging medical services and steel uh, regulations and the all the transportation lanes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one day you wake up and realize we've merged and you didn't even know it. So we've got to get rid of NAFTA. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it the same way we've done it in the past. First of all, through good organization and leadership. Secondly, good tools for you to put to use. And three, the determination to get the job done. Now there's a fourth thing, actually. And that is we have to uh, target the opinion molders. That does not mean we don't uh, care about the man on the street. We do. He's the person we're trying to save. But the person who's going to stop NAFTA is our local official, the local Boy Scout leader, the local Kiwanian, the local member of the Chamber of Commerce, the local union leader, the local firefighter, those people that run the community. They are the people we are going to have to target they are the people we are going to have to convince. They are the people who will get the job done once they understand the problem. And we help them organize. So our campaign will be geared for them. We're already seeing moves among various Americans that they realize that NAFTA is the problem. We need to build on that understanding. The timetable for the implementation of the North American Union is the year 2010. We stopped them in 76. We played a major role in stopping them in 2000, and then again with the, F the FTAA timetable. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, we can do it again. <laughs> believe me, there's nothing more paranoid than a crooked politician exposed. <laughs> And believe me, when you start exposing these people for what they really are, they cut and run. It's their modus operandi. But we are running out of time. And so let's get started preparing ourselves now for a very interesting few years and put everything we can into the fight. Thank you, Art.